Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture uh, number 9 on this series on the psychology of language. Now this is of, or from this lecture onwards, uh, we are uh, moving ahead into the complex uh, world of language. Now when I say that what do I mean? So uh, basically what we are doing is we are switching gears and moving to another aspect of language. Up till now, 1 to lecture number 8, we were discussing the basics of language. So, we are looking at how language is formed and we are looking at speech production. From this lecture onwards till uh, many more lectures to come, we will be looking at the complex aspects of language in terms of how the speech that we produce, they combine to form the language itself. So, we look, we are looking at those aspects of language. So, we will start off by looking at words, then looking at what are sentences and then looking at sentence comprehension and discourse and many more things to do with uh, the language itself. And towards the end of uh, these course series, we will look into some social aspects of language. So, since this course is not uh, focused on to the social aspects of language, so maybe we will try and cover a couple of lectures on that. So, uh, this is a kind of a break point uh, where we are moving or switching gears into the language itself. So, before we start uh, today's lecture, which is a very interesting lecture because we will be dealing with words. Up till now, we have been dealing with speech sounds and how these speech sounds combine to form morphemes or, or consonants and vowels. Today, we will look at how these consonants and vowels, they combine to form words, what is the meaning of word and things like that. It is quite interesting. But uh, before we do that, let us take a look back at what we have done up till now. So, we will go into a small journey and review what we have done up till now because that will give us a sort of a context in uh, which we will present today's chapter. So, we started off the first two lectures by looking at the nature of language. What is it and why it should be used? And for that purpose, we started off by looking at the very basic language which exists out there which is called the animal language. And so, animal languages generally are uh, categorized under something called animal communication system. So, the first thing that we did was we separated or we uh, distinguish between what is a communication system and what is language. And the very basic definition is that communication is the uh, core form of a language. Language can do more than communication. So, if language is a, is, a, is a universal set, a communication system is a subset of that particular set. So, we looked at some forms of animal communication system. We looked at certain model animal communication system for example, the honey bee waggle or the wawet monkey calls or the squirrel calls and these uh, we tried to define through this how an animal communication system is built up and what are the characteristics of a system like that. We further moved on quickly into understanding the human language system and looking at the properties of human language system and then following that looked at how the human language is actually arranged in terms of the phoneme, the morpheme, the word, the sentence uh, and, and the discourse and then we have something called syntax which is the structure of language and the grammar which is the rules of language. So, we looked at how this uh, and also the phase structure rule. So, basically how language is structured, the human language is structured basically in the English domain. So, in using the English language as a model system, we looked at how the language system is developed. Now, once that was clear, 
we moved a little bit into the history of language of how human language uh, uh, came forward. So, uh, we started looking at the uh, uh, the Neanderthal man, the Homo sapiens and how the development of language came from those people. And so, there we looked at the continuity and the discontinuity argument of how language developed. So, that is another uh, thing that we looked at and finally, we looked at some reasons of how the basic language which is called the proto language of the our great great grandfathers which were chimpanzees and monkeys how that evolved into something called the present day language. And uh, we uh, looked at several evidences to that and one uh, big evidence or one supportive evidence to this process of gradual development of language from the proto language that our great 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 grandfathers used to have is the idea of a pidgin which stands in between and says uh, how this development would have progressed. So, that is what we did in the first section. Now, once we are clear of what language is and what it does, we started looking at various methodologies of doing research on language. And so, in the sec sec uh, second section or lecture number 3 and 4, what we were discussing is how to do research in language. We looked at the premise of a language research cycle or basically the research cycle. So, we looked at how theories lead to hypothesis which leads to observation to leads which leads to conclusions and how these conclusions lead back to theories. So, from theory to hypothesis to observations is basically uh, sort of uh, in inductive reasoning uh, deductive reasoning and then the way back from observations to conclusions and then back to theory is inductive reasoning. And so, we looked at how these two type of reasonings or how <coughs> this process goes through. So, we looked at what are problem statements, how a theory leads to a, uh, 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 to a development of a hypothesis. So, we looked at what is a hypothesis, what is a theory and how they are related. Then we looked at how uh, these hypothesis leads to generation of a problem statement or a problem that can be uh, uh, worked out or that can be uh, solved. We looked at something called experimental designs which are the road map of doing a particular experiment. So, since we are focused in this course on the psychology of language, we are focused on experiment based or lab based experiments in language. So, we are we are uh, binded ourselves to those kind of experiments. So, what we did is we took a number of research which was done in, in psychology and taking those as model systems uh, tried to explain the whole process of doing research in language specifically and in behavioral sciences in a general form. So, we looked at all those kinds of things of how to develop hypothesis, how to develop uh, the research design, what kind of designs are there, we looked at the between subject and within subject designs and, and then we also looked at what do we measure the idea of independent variable and dependent variable and how, how dependent variables are actually manifestations of independent variable. So, that is what we did and we took model systems to explain that. Towards the end of that section or that uh, uh, portion on doing research, we looked at the brain areas uh, which language is connected to and we focus was mainly in the Wernicke and the Broca area, Broca area which is responsible for speech uh, uh, production <coughs> in the Wernicke area which is responsible for perception of speech or generating meaning out of speech. So, that is what we were doing and towards the end of this particular section on research, we looked at newer technologies which are used for doing research in language for example, EEG, MRI, fMRI and eye tracking. So, how these techniques help us in doing research on language. Now, once these two patterns were clear, we describe, describe what a language is and how to do research in language, we jumped into the fact of how do we hear language. So, when somebody is producing uh, a language or somebody is producing a sound, how do we know it is language and what apparatuses are really involved. And so, we started off by looking at the language apparatus system in the uh, human brain. So, we started off by first looking at what are the primary uh, items or what are the 
primary materials uh, needed for hearing and so those are sound waves because sound travels through a uh, wave propagation medium or it travels as a wave so we looked at the properties of wave and we uh, and we specifically focused on two properties of wave one is called amplitude and the other is called frequency so we looked at how this amplitude and frequency are in uh, total describe a wave because sounds travel in uh, these wave properties so we looked at that and then we looked at properties of the fundamental frequency prop uh, uh, pro the fundamental frequency property and the overtones and those kind of things that we looked at. Once we are very, very clear of how, what is the raw material of uh, the language, of hearing a language which is the sound, we looked at the apparatus which actually hears language or which help us in hearing language which was the ear. So, we, we did a uh, look into how this ear is made up and how it picks sounds. Once we are clear about that, we looked at how the basic vowel and consonant sounds are produced. So, we looked at that and then we looked at several variations of it. For example, <coughs> looking at the form and the sorents and looking at fricatives and affricates and those kind of things. So, we looked at how so, uh, these these uh, uh, produce or how these uh, so, uh, the, the basic sounds of speech are perceived. Now, one way of looking at uh, the perception of these speech sound is through the spectrograph. So, we look through the me method of spectrograph how these speech sound are produced. And so, uh, that was what that was where we were looking at the uh, production of these particular things. So, uh, we also looked at how the what the speech stream consists of. Um, uh, as, as I have described before, the formants, the sorens, <coughs> and the phonation, and so on and so forth. And we also looked at how speech perception is done. Now, it is believed that speech is single or it is continuous in nature. But when we look at the spectrograph, we see areas of uh, 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 high activity and areas of no activity. So, uh, 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 we explain this finding in terms of categorical perception. And so, we looked at how hum <coughs> humans actually undergo something called categorical perception and what is the need for categorical perception. Now, towards the end of this section, we looked at how the development of speech perception happens in small children and the newborns or infants and we dealt with several issues there of how this really works and how the small children develop the ability of hearing speech or looking at uh, the, the uh, various factors of speech spoken and we ended the section by looking at several theories of speech perception and three theories that we did, uh, discussed in detail was the motor theory which says that speech production, uh, the, the speech perception uh, happens through something called either the motor theory, the general auditory framework theory or uh, the uh, idea of direct realism that how speech is perceived. So, motor theory says that speech perception happens by looking at the um, gestures, certain gestures that you do by producing speech and it is believed that speech is special. The auditory framework theory would reject that and it will say that no speech is not like that, speech is special, is not special. Rather, what is happening is that uh, the speech that we produce is a general auditory, uh, it, it matches the general auditory signal, it is not special at all. And then the idea of direct realism, which basically says that the sound which hit our ears, that has all the information needed and the human being do not have to do anything on, on their own to perceive this speech. So, that is where we are looking at the speech apparatus or how humans perceive speech, how do they hear speech, how the speech perception happens. Now, once that was clear, we started looking at how speech is produced first of all. Now, we, we, we are not sure that how do you hear it, but we wanted to see how speech was produced and that is what we did in uh, lecture number 7 and 8. We looked at the apparatus and the system which produces speech and so we focused on to the vocal cord. We looked at the vocal box, the vocal tract and speech perception systems and how consonants and vowels are produced. So, we looked at how uh, vowels are produced in terms of uh, uh, the jaw movement and the lip movement and so the triangular theory of vowel production, the R, E, O which is the basic vowels which are there and we also looked at how consonants are produced. So, consonant basically if, if you produce vowel, vowel, you do not constrict, you do not stop the air which is flowing out of your vocal cord and that is how vowel is produced. The only way, I mean so the air which is coming out uninterrupted from the vocal cord, it is directed to the mouth and changes in shape of the jaw or the tongue is what leads to the different vowels which are there. 
the moment you constrict the air which is coming from the vocal cord it is a consonant which is produced and so these consonants are produced uh, or there are different kind of consonants first of all and they are produced by blocking the air at different places. So, there are three types of blocking it could be the manner of articulation, it could be the place of articulation. So, manner in which way it is uh, blocked, the place of articulation where it is blocked the air and the third is the voicing. So, what is the the, the uh, space or what is the time difference between the production of the uh, consonant and the vibration of the vocal fold and that is called voicing and uh, unvoicing. So, we looked at how these things uh, really work in, in reality. Then uh, we looked at the speech areas of the brain, we looked at a detailed idea of the Wernicke Geshwan model which basically says that the Broca area and uh, Wernicke area are connected and so how they lead to the perception and production of speech and we looked at several other cortical areas which are involved in the production of speech. Once we were done with that, we looked at several models of speech production and so we looked at uh, uh, the different models that we looked at was the uh, feed forward and feedback model and so we looked at how the feed forward and feedback model, feed forward model controls the, uh, voc uh, the vo vocal articulators and the feedback model through the auditory feedback or the somatosensory feedback makes the correction to uh, the uh, vocal cord or the way the speech is being produced. So, we looked at that and we also looked at the dual stream model in comparison to the feedback model which we were looking at um, how uh, the ventral stream and the dorsal stream two different streams uh, are involved in production of speech. We also looked at the computational DIVA model. Now, further to that we added our uh, we we added the development of speech production. So, how speech is developed and we looked at the frame content model and some other models of speech production of how babbling leads to the actual production of speech in infants and we ended the section by looking at some social aspects of speech production. So, that is where we ended the, uh, the last. Uh, section which was lecture number 8 and this is lecture number 9 where we will start dealing with uh, more basic issues of language and we will start with the words because that the word itself or word as it is said this is the basic of language. So, let us start looking at what are words and what are the various characteristics and peculiarity, uh, peculiarities of this word. So, basically what are words? The basic speech sounds are phones and you combine them you get a morpheme which are part of words but they are not word in itself. Word is a special thing, word is a special character or word is a special uh, item which can express some idea through it and that is what words are. So, basically words are uh, generally believed to be the minimal units of meaningful speech. So, any speech as you can see the words are min the minimal unit of any meaningful speech that can stand alone. Although we talk about morphemes like ing is a morpheme, they cannot stand alone. So, they, they, do, they do provide uh, some kind of support to sentences, uh, but they can can't stand on their alone. Morphemes combine bas basic speech sounds to form a structure, but they are not words because they cannot express meaning. So, words are basically then minimal unit of uh, meaningful speech that uh, that can be produced in isolation or they can stand alone. Now, however, words generally occur uh, within large utterances and their form is influenced uh, by the context in which they occur. Now, generally speaking, you never hear single words, right? And so, words generally occur in larger sentences or larger utterances, and that is how the uh, the the uh, meaning of word keeps on changing. The idea is that word you generally never see words alone, they occur in uh, sentences and because they occur in utterances or sentences or longer utterances, the, the basic form of the word keeps on changing or you get different forms of the word or the way the word is there. For example, boy or the uh, boys are playing which is a plural. So, uh, basically the boy is the lemma which is the core word and the, the, the um, uh, boys is basically a plural of boy and so that is the form of using it. So, uh, basically what I want to <coughs> tell here is that you generally do not uh, encounter single words, you uh, hear them in utterances and these utterances the context in which they uh, we are heard that changes the meaning of the word. Now, words have uh, something called dual nature, most words have dual nature or they have 
two aspects. Any word has two aspects or two nature. One is the phonological form of a word, which is the outward form and then you have the semantic representation of a word. Phonological word, this is the inward form. Now, phonological or outward form is how a word is pronounced. When you are pronouncing a word, for example, you are pronouncing a cat. Now, when you are pronouncing cat, the way you pronounce cat, which is a monosyllable word with three phones, cat, that is the form of the word. So, writing C A T and pronouncing it as cat, a single syllable word, a monosyllabic word, this is basically what is the phonological form. But what it refers to is called the semantic representation and that is the inward resemblance. So, cat the three uh, letters combined together to uh, to represent a, <coughs> a feline um, animal and that is what the semantic representation is. So, each word has a uh, phonological form which is how it is spoken and then a semantic form which is what it is representing to right or the underlying thing. And so, then we com come to that what are words good for. So, words basically are something called a label for concepts. Word actually are <coughs> this word cat here is a label for a concept and the concept here is a feline animal. Cat is a feline animal and so the concept is cat. Within the cat you can have several other kind of uh, cats. You could have the Kaliki cat or the some other forms of cat which, which might be uh, uh, there. But then within that particular thing you can have the cat is the concept and within that you can have different forms of cat or feline animal is one another concept which is higher than the cat because within the cat itself you could have a cat or some other feline animal and that is what the word represents. So, words are then generally what are words? These are labeled for concepts. Now, once I say words are labeled for concepts, let us try and understand what are concepts. Concepts are mental representation of statistical regularity in our experience. Now, if we look at so, words are minimal unit of meaningful speech that can be stand alone. For example, if I talk about apple or red, these are words. So, words are then it is a mini <coughs> unit of meaningful speech which can stand alone. Now, at a more abstract level, words are labeled for concepts. So, what are concepts now? As we saw, these are many meaningful representations of some, uh, st uh, some sort of statistical regularity in our own experience. For example, uh, Let us look at, so I will give you three or four definitions and of a concept and let us see if you can understand what it is. So, uh, contains liquid, this is one definition and held by hand, you can hold it by hand and then uh, you can, it is easy to drink from it. If I am talking about these three features of an element of a concept, you can quickly come up with the word cup here which is a label for this concept. Now, these three things characteristics that we have defined is basically defining the concept or these are uh, these are uh, properties of the concept and cup which is the word which represents this concept is the label for this concept and that is what words generally are. Thus, so, as, as I said, these are the properties of the concept and this is the label of a concept. So, this is a word and this is what it is and so, these are group of words and these define the characteristics of a concept, any concept and the concept that I was looking here for was, was the cup and what is the cup? Cup is is is, is falling under a, a other higher note which is a drinking vessel, but cup in itself is a concept and the higher than that there are other concepts than the cup or construct. For example, it is a vessel for drinking and then it is a, um, so on and so forth you can move forward. So, basically here cup is the word uh, or uh, the label for the word or uh, label for the concept that we are defining and these are the properties of the concept. So, then uh, concepts are representations of classes of objects. So, what are uh, uh, concepts? These are representations for classes or objects or events. So, classes of objects for example, let us say cheese which is a class of object or events for example, roll and they provide us with so, the concepts are representations of certain classes of objects or events and they provide us with expectations. So, what, what do they do? 
of course, they are representation of classes of objects and uh, events and how does <coughs> they help? They provide us with expectations that guide our responses to newer instances of those objects and events. Let us say that <coughs> the concept of cheese. Now, cheese is something that is uh, food that we eat, it is made up of milk and there are certain properties. Now, let us say tomorrow and there are several varieties of she, uh, cheese for example, the cheddar cheese, the normal cheese. Um, goat cheese and so on and so forth. So, different kinds of cheese are there. If you ever visit uh, uh, Germany or any European country, you will see hundreds and th uh, hundreds of varieties of cheese which are there. <coughs> the same Amul cheese that we eat here, there are various varieties of cheese out there. So, basically let us say tomorrow we come up with a new kind of cheese or, uh, or, or a new kind of uh, uh, item uh, which is made to be eaten with bread and has some salty taste, uh, how do we uh, or how do we know that this is cheese? The uh, concept help us in identifying or categorizing this new thing as cheese because it will have certain properties, uh, the new item will have certain properties and if these properties match the properties of the concept, we categorize them into that particular concept and we call it a cheese. So, if, uh, let us say the same thing that uh, goat cheese is there, if it is made from some other uh, animal's milk and it provides the same taste and it is used for eating, uh, for eating, then we can use these two concepts to say that this is a particular kind of a cheese. So, uh, these are representations of classes and objects and they help us in uh, expectations or they give us expectations to guide our uh, responses to newer incidents if it ever occurs. Now, some concepts, now it is not always that concepts have a label, sometimes you have concepts which have no label itself. For example, there are several uh, uh, objects in, in this world which have uh, uh, no label as such. For the cons, uh, uh, Right now, I do not remember, but there are other uh, concepts, there are some concepts which have no label. The concept of, uh, I will come up with the word and I will let you know. So, there are several concepts which have no label or which have no definition. So, we know it exists, but we cannot provide a label to it and it, it could be because um, it, it, it houses a number of uh, abstract properties into it and so they are not clear matches into it, but so it could be uh, uh, that a concept can have no label itself. Now, words are believed to have the dual nature as we have said before, a uh, word has a phonological form, it is how it sounds as I said in cat, this is a monosyllable word which, which is um, sounding like ka, a and t. This is the uh, the various uh, phones which have been used producing this and it also has a semantic representation which is what it means. So, what does cat mean? It is a feline animal uh, which is uh, used as a pet and then uh, it eats, it runs after mice and so many definitions which are there. And so, that is what most words are, um, are there. So, it is how it sounds and what it means are the two basic forms of any words. So, these are what is words. So, word is um, a meaningful speech unit <coughs> which are basically labeled for concepts and then it has two different forms. Now, having said that this is what words are, there are different types of words. So, let us have a quick look at what different kinds of word exist. Now, we have something called content words. Now, what are content words? Content words are those words which are labeled for concepts. So, content words actually are meaning. So, those words which represent meaning are called content words and similarly those words, so we have the content word and then we also have something called function word and what is function word? We will reach, uh, we will we'll talk about function word in a moment. So, what are function word? These are those words which are used for grammatical purposes. For example, two of these kind of words are used for grammatical purposes, they have no actual meaning as such, but uh, those words which are used for meaning are called content words. Now, what are con content words? Content words are labeled for concepts, these are open class. So, content words generally are labeled for concepts, they have, they are called the open class words. you can have changes in that. So, it can change from singular to plural. For example, boy, boys, uh, dog, dogs, hen, goose, geese. So, you can have changes in them and then normal vocabulary or most part of our vocabulary, 
bulk of our vocabulary are made up of content words. So, let us start looking at that. So, there are three type of uh, 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 generally content words, you have something called the noun, the verb and the adjective. Let us uh, we'll be looking into that uh, one by one. So, let us first define what are uh, content words. So, content words are those words which have meaning and uh, they have uh, they are so content words have a label, they are open class in nature, they can change their forms and they have vocabulary, uh, bulk of the vocabulary is made up of content words. Similarly, you have function words. So, what are function words? These are those words which are limited in number. So, limited number words are function words. Also, they are stable. So, you do not see changes in that. For example, of, to, and you do not. So, plural of and is not ands, right. It is the same and which is used and so they are stable in nature and these are the called the close class words. That is the difference between the uh, function uh, words and the content words and also content words are type of concept they define and the role the play or uh, the uh, the type of role they play. So, basically the content words are of two type, one is the type of concept that they define and then content words are also those words which represent the which are represented by role they play in a sentence, these are content words, they are defined by what concept they are defining or in terms of what role they are playing in a sentence. And so, there are different type of content words, you have the noun, you have the verb and there you have the adjective. Let us look at that. What is the noun? A noun represents an object, people, animal, things, places and so on and so forth and so it is a content word. It is describing a label or is defining a particular kind of concept. Verbs, it represents events, action states and so they are defining the role that they play and so sometimes or, or most of the times you have the uh, verbs which are action words. For example, run, buy, eat, these are defining actions. So, action uh, states or different states is uh, different states of uh, action or different states of the body that is what basically are the verbs. And between the nouns and the verbs, you generally have something called the, um, the adjectives. And what are adjectives? Adjectives lie in the border of uh, or uh, these describe the or they are used to uh, qualify the noun or basically enrich the noun. So, they describe the properties of an object. So, either uh, adjectives define the property of an object or are perce perceptual experience to them. So, either now uh, it qualifies the noun. So, it is adjectives are used in that way or it can adjectives can also define our experiences, uh, perceptual experience to a uh, particular experience. For example, beautiful uh, lady. So, that, that they are defining or uh, lavender uh, smell flower and so in this cases what is happening is uh, they, are, they are defining the perceptual experiences. So, either they can define the properties of an object or they can define the perceptual experiences related to that. And so, generally most content words are called close class because new words are constantly added and old words free from use and so I have labeled here for you what are content words and what are functional words. Now, in addition to uh, the noun, verb and the adjective, we also have the preposition. Now, the preposition, you know, we have looked at the content words, let us start looking at what are function words. They serve grammatical purposes and I said most uh, uh, content words are um, those, uh, those most functional words are those words which are there only for the purpose of serving grammatical purposes. And in that the first line is or the first uh, class of word is basically called the preposition. So, what are prepositions? These are close class words all the prepositions are closed class word which lie in the boundary between the content and the function words. So, basically preposition is uh, it cannot be said as a true function word, they lie on the boundary of the content word and uh, the function word. They either have little meaning, so sometimes they have very less meaning for example, look at of or it could also be in terms of having um, meaningful for example, over when I write the word over it has more meaning, of has no meaning but over means it is uh, of is kind of a um, uh, word which has no meaning as a sentence connector. But when I say over it represents the state, it represents say something is above something 
over something. So, and also over will take its uh, uh, meaning depending on the utterance that is there. So, uh, over the yonder or over the table are two different uh, ways of looking at the same word. So, it is meaningful and it contributes to the semantics. So, prepositions are uh, close class words and they fall into the boundary of uh, the function words and content words and they can have uh, uh, they can have either full meaning or it they can have more meaning or it, it can be a totally non meaning kind of a word. For example, as I get a definition for example, of has no meaning as such, but over the word has more meaning. So, these are what prepositions are and so they contribute to either the semantics or they contribute to nothing at all. Now, with the prepositions which is a kind of function word you have something called determiners and so what are determiners uh, like noun uh, to people or things they reflect to. They are used to link the noun with reference for then these reference are people or things since noun are people and things that they are referring to. So, basically that is what a determiners are and so we have uh, <coughs> the determiner a for example is always used to introduce a new noun, a noun which is it being introduced for the first time and the determiner the is always used to a reintroduce a noun. For example, when you are introducing a noun with <coughs> the determiner a uh, which means that the noun has come for the first time, but if you use the determiner the it basically means <coughs> the noun has been referred to somewhere else and uh, the second reference is with the the. So, A introduces a new noun and the following noun has at least already been mentioned and then in uh, terms of determiners you have something called conjunctions and as the name suggests what does conjunction do? It joins together various sentences to form larger sentences. So, they combine phrases and sentences into larger units and so and but because are conjunctions and so these are function words. So, noun, verb and adjectives are content words because they refer to certain meanings and preposition determiner, determiners and conjunctions are function words because they are grammatically serving grammatical purposes. But preposition is a special class of word which can either mean they, they are close uh, uh, they are close class words and so sometimes they can generate meaning or sometimes they may not be able to generate meaning and so that is what uh, the uh, different types of words are. But then you also have some kind of word which are called shape shifters and so what are those? These are open class uh, words for example, what are certain open class words for example, nouns, verbs or adjectives they change their shape depending on context. And so they are called shape shifters. So, uh, open class words which change their meaning depending on context are called shape shifters. For example, I can say one duck, but when I say a plural of it or more than one, I say two ducks. And so, the same duck has changed its shape or I say in terms of verb, I say I walk every day, but when it is specific time, I say I walk yesterday, I do not walk yesterday, I walked yesterday since this ed and this ed represents tense time. So, when it is representing time verbs are changing its form and so this is what the difference is and this is what shape shifters are uh, basically. So, shape shifters are open class close class words which change their meaning depending on the utterance or depending on the context in which they are used. Now, the basic form of a word any word, the basic form of any word is called the lemma, which is the most basic form of any word. For example, the word run. The word run is the basic form and other forms of it is run, runner, running, uh, runs, all these words are the lexeme of this word. These are the ways in which can, can, can be used. The root word is still run. So, lemma is the basic form of any word which you generally form in the dictionary and then lexeme are uh, all forms of a word can take. For example, look at man. So, the word the lemma of this particular sequence is man and the lexemes are man's men, 
men's and so on and so forth. Similarly, the, leg, the lemma here is the boy and the various leg zims are boys, boys, boys and so on and so forth and similarly here run, runs, runs and running and walk, walk, walked and walking and so these two are the adjective, uh, sorry, the verb, verb shape shifters and these are noun shape shifters, right. So, clear? That is how we actually go into looking at different shape shifters and different words. Now, phonology of word forms. Word in isolation composed of, in isolation the words are composed of one and more syllables. So, word is generally any word is a string of syllables. Example, look at begin. Now, if you look at begin, it is composed of two syllables. So, any form of word has generally um, uh, uh, a word could have one syllable or it could have multiple syllables. For example, if you look at begin, it has two syllables. If you look at the word cat, it has just one syllable. So, most words are either produced in isolation with one syllable or it could be composed of one or more syllable. For example, the word begins. Now, words are either uh, monosyllabic in nature or it is multisyllabic. Most words are monosyllabic or they could be multisyllabic and as I gave an example, this is the monosyllabic word and this is the multisyllabic word. Within utterances, phonemes regroup to form syllables across word boundaries. So, if you uh, and, and this also changes the, the way the word is pronounced, the syllables are pronounced, it also changes in utterances. So, the same word in isolation would have different pronunciation, but when it comes to uh, utterances or when the same word plays a role in an utterance, the way that they, they are spelled or the way the phonemes are there, they re regroup. Sometimes the phonemes regroup and the syllables or the word boundaries may change. For example, in isolation, we can say it is an elephant. And in an utterance, when you say it is an elephant is what actually you say. So, it is an elephant. But when you are looking at it in isolation, it is an, when you say it is an elephant or you say elephant, that is how it should look like. But in an utterance, this is what we actually say. It is an elephant. And when you are saying it, that is what you are actually saying. And so, here what has happened is the phoning has regrouped to form syllables across word, different syllables across word boundaries. Now, let us look at the so, most uh, the for how does the phonology of a word describe? The phonology of a word is generally described in terms of its onset and its rhyme. Now, most words are as I said they are either monosyllabic and, uh, and, and multisyllabic. So, so, the way they are pronounced is described in terms of their onset and their time. And so, what is the onset? Let us look at a sample word cash. Now, this cash has two parts. There is a uh, 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 multisyllabic word and so they have two parts. The first initial consonant and then the, the consonant proposition which or, or this is called the initial consonant and then this is called the rhyme. We will look into that, right. And so, ca uh, the cash word cash has an onset which is the C and this is called the consonantal proportion consonantal proportion of syllable. So, this is the onset, this is how the word starts, you start speaking the word cash. So, you as soon as you start speaking the word cash, you start with a C and this the pronunciation of this consonant C is called the consonantial proportion of the syllable and this is the C and following it you have something called the rhyme which is the word ash here, cash, cash and so the ash is the rhyme here and this is this is the vowel following the consonant. So, A is the vowel and SH is the consonant that you have here. So, vowel following the consonant and so most uh, words follow this kind of a phonological word form. Now, of course, the rhyme is also further divided, but well, let us uh, look at it in, in, in a sequence. So, most phonological word pronunciation or word pronunciations, they have a, <coughs> uh, be it multisyllable or uh, the monosyllable, uh, most words are pronounced in this format. You have the first 
cons, uh, con, uh, the uh, the uh, the consonantial proportion. If it's a vowel, it could be also be a vowel for, uh, uh, proportion, and then you ha could have a rhyme to it. Now, onset the initial consonantial proportion of a syllable is basically what is called the onset, uh, the, uh, the, the onset and it matches uh, and one has to match this to provide alliteration right. And so, what is uh, the, the initial uh, consonant proportion of a syllable in this case in our cache C is the one which we are looking at. And when we want to produce alliteration which is the same type of word which, uh, which is repeated for example, look at here the bold and the beautiful. So, what we are doing is we are matching these words the B word or then and there in this case th is the sound that we are matching and so for producing alliteration which is a form of uh, grammar where the same kind of speech sounds are uh, matched we need this kind of an onset or we use the onset. And then you have the rhyme now any uh, spoken word has an initial uh, uh, consonantial proportion uh, uh, as the onset and following it we have the rhyme for in, in our cash example the C is the initial consonant uh, onset. So, this is called the onset and the ash which follows is called the rhyme. Now, what is a rhyme? A rhyme is a vowel nucleus and a final consonant proportion which is the coda of the syllables and so it, it has the ash. So, the A sound which is the vowel and the SH sound which is the consonant and this is called the vowel nucleus and this is called the coda of the, uh, because this has the consonant here and so that is what it is. So, when I say cash it has the initial onset, it has the middle vowel and this is the coda of it. Now, matches rhymes or uh, match rhymes to rhyme for example, cash dash dash cash plays and race and that is what it is all about. So, the rhyme generally that we are talking about it has two parts it has the nucleus which is the vowel and then it has the coda which is the final consonant proportion. So, then any word spoken phonologically whether it is multisyllable or uh, uh, unisyllable or multisyllable it has it generally has an onset and it has a <coughs> rhyme. The onset in our cache is the consonant uh, consonantal proportion of the syllable which is the C here and then the rhyme here is the ash which has the new uh, the vowel proportion middle vowel proportion which is the A word here and the SH which is the final con, uh, con, uh, the final consonantial uh, proportion. So, then most syllables that you have has an onset and a rhyme and the rhyme is then further divided into a nucleus and a coda as you can see a syllable can be divided into the onset which is the uh, how are the words spoken the phonology of word and the phonology of word is dependent upon the syllable the way the syllables are pronounced. Now, cat has a single syllable word, but cash is a multi syllable word or begin is a multi syllable word the b and the gen and so basically the stress on the, the kind of stress that you put into these will define how a word is spoken. Now, a syllable can be divided into its onset now most syllables uh, since we are taking the word speech here which is a multi syllable word we are <coughs> looking at how they are pronounced. So, there, there, there is an initial consonantal proportion and the rhyme. Now, this can be further subdivided into the nucleus which is a vowel and the middle of the syllable and the coda which is the final consonantial proportion. Not all syllables have an onset or a coda, but they all have at least a nucleus. The structure of the one syllable speech is shown here. So, basically what it says is it, it is it could be possible that all syllables uh, uh, may not have a coda or uh, they may not have a onset. So, sometimes the syllables may not have an onset or they might not have a coda, but then generally most syllables do have a nucleus the middle <coughs> sound which is there. And so, if you look at the syllable uh, how speech is pronounced we look at the onset which is the sp sound speech and the ee which is the vowel the middle vowel pronunciation and then the final consonantial proportion which is the ch sound. So, speech ch chi speech that is how basically these are mapped. Now, there are several phonetic uh, 
rules, phonetic, phonetic rules that we use in producing words. Now, the rules for combining words. Now, phonemes are generally the building blocks of phonological word form, but all combination of phonemes uh, do not result in word. Phonetic rules uh, help in combining phonemes into sequences to form word. Generally, phones <coughs> or the basic speech sound are what is are what uh, what are necessary for producing the uh, the the speech sound, right? But then, all combinations of the the phones may not result in a word. Sometimes you have combined certain phones and they may not be a word at all. So, then to form legal words, we use something called the uh, phonotactic rules and what these phonotactic rules actually say, they help us in combining phones into sequence to form different kind of words. So, rules for combining phonemes into sequence of form words. For example, seal letter is possible, but seal the letter is not possible. Now, if we look at this seal, <coughs> the way this seal is uh, seal letter is pronounced. Now, the thing is that if we could just simply combine, combine, we can have the seal letter word, but we cannot have this kind of a th thing. We could not have seal the letter. The reason is that no word in English starts with DL. So, sequences that DL violates phonetic rules in English. Also, phonetic rules distinguishes between possible non words. For example, trap, flain, and gorp are possible words, but impossible words are T B E R because no word in English starts with a T B, right? Or uh, so this is this is uh, what it is. So T R is allowed, but T B is not allowed. And as you can see, this is the nucleus, the final con con uh, consonantial proportion and initial consonantial proportion are the on <coughs> onset. Similarly, fnel is not possible and grop is not possible. And so, this kind of the phonetic rules generally speaking are all grammatical rules, but most people who actually speak a language, they have an implicit idea of this rule. So, you may not have a written rule for it, but you do have an implicit idea of this kind of rules. Also, phonetic rules vary from language to language. For example, the ski is legal in Japanese means moon, but not in English also street not legal in Japanese, but it is legal in English and so phonetic rules will differ across different languages. Now, let us look at since we have looked at word as uh, phone, uh, as uh, the one property of word in terms of phones, let us look at word as symbols. As I said word has two properties, any word can have two forms, it can have the phonetic form of how it is produced or how it is spelled uh, or how it uh, how it is said and then it can have the semantic form which is the meaning of it. So, let us look at word as symbols, word as meanings. Now, word is sound symbols for concepts. The words are generally sound symbols for concepts. For example, look at the word dog which is English, the word goi which is Chinese and the word inu which is Japanese. Now, all these words the dog, the nu and the inu they use different pronunciation, they have different pronunciation, but at one level which is the limit, uh, level of the meaning they point to the fact that they are representing a four footed animal with tail and men's best friend and are pet and so on and so forth and they can bark also. So, in terms of meaning all of them are representing the same concept, but in terms of pronunciation if you look into it they have different pronunciation. So, meaning of a word is concept is symbolizes. So, the meaning of any word is equal to the concept that it symbolizes. And the concept that it symbolizes then is equal to the mental representation. This concept are actually mental representations of classes of objects or events. So, 
meaning are basically concept and this concept are basically mental representation, how it is represented in the mind. So, concepts or symbols, so meaning of a word is the concept that it is symbolizing and the concepts in itself which are symbols, they are the mental representations of certain kind of uh, events or objects in the real world. Now, where does the meaning of a word come from? As we looked at the every word has a meaning. Now, where is the meaning of a word coming from? That is the basic question. How does a word acquire its meaning? As we saw that different pronunciations are there and they refer to the same concept which is the dog, a four footed animal as I described and the mental representation of it is in terms of this form. Now, the thing is that each word has its meaning, each word acquire a meaning. The problem is where do words acquire their meaning from? and this is basically called the symbol grounding problem. So, what is the symbol grounding problem? The symbol grounding problem explains that where do words acquire their meaning. So, words are based basically symbols, uh, but where does the meaning of a symbol come from? So, as I said meanings are concepts and concepts which are symbols they are the mental representation. So, words basically are meaning as we said and meaning is basically the concept. So, basically where do words acquire the meaning that they are? Words refer to certain concepts or they refer to certain ideas. So, where do they get this idea that is where the problem is and that is what the symbol grounding problem is. Now, there are several explanations to it, there are several uh, ways of looking at this problem and the traditional way of looking at it or the traditional approach to looking at it is called the cognitive traditional cognitive approach which provides an answer to the problem of where do symbols come from and that is or the simple ground, grounding problem. And what do they say? Symbols acquire meaning through relationship with other symbols. So, any symbol they acquire meaning by relating to other symbols or symbols like that, that is what the cognitive approach says. So, one symbol when it is expressed is another symbol and uh, that is how they uh, acquire their meaning, they get their meaning. So, uh, basically and they gave an example of dictionary, when you look at the dictionaries they define words as other words, look at any word in the dictionary. For example, uh, look at train, train is defined in terms of some other word, look at watch, the idea of watch is the watch word watch is defined as in terms of other words. And so, when, when word word is defined in terms of other word or one symbol is defined in terms of other symbol that is how the symbols attain the meaning. But then there is a problem to that and the problem to that is basically proposed by someone called uh, John Sorrell. John Sorrell in 1980 uh, they he provided or he produced the basic problem with this kind of approach and that is called the Chinese room argument. And so, what is the Chinese room argument? The Chinese room argument basically says that let us say that you are traveling and the traditional approach says that by defining words as other words, defining symbols in terms of other symbols, we acquire meaning into it. Let us take this and test this using the Chinese room problem. Now, let us say that you go to China and then you are uh, for some reason you have been uh, you have you have been kept in a room or you have been enclosed in a room. Now, and, and then when enclosed in a room you have been given a Chinese dictionary. Now, within the dictionary you will have several words and these words will be defined as Chinese symbols defined in terms of Chinese symbols. Now, each word that you look into in the dictionary will be defined in terms of other symbols which are there. But by studying you, you may, might be able to learn the whole dictionary and all words out of it, but then you will uh, never be able to learn the Chinese language or what, what each word is actually saying. And so, this is the problem with this symbol grounding problem or the cognitive approach to it that symbols can since symbols express themselves in other symbols, they attain the meaning out of, out of that, that is the problem with the uh, with the approach which is taken by simple uh, people or in, in terms of the, uh, the early cognitive view. And so, what is the Chinese room problem? It is a philosophical demonstration that meanings cannot arise solely from relationship among symbols. Now, had that been possible if I give you a Chinese dictionary and do not know Chinese and I looking at the dictionary of how one word is defined in terms of other words or how one word symbol is defined in another word symbol, you should be able to learn Chinese, but that is not is ha that is not happening. So, at least some of the words we use must be grounded in the real world experience. And so, this basically says that 
to start with we should actually have some words which should be expressed in terms of real words or real life words or real experience words and if that is not possible then we may not be able to define how word attain symbol. For example, look at this the Chinese dictionary would not help you understand the meaning of this symbol if you do not already know how, uh, how no Chinese at least some of the words we use must be grounded or relative. So, you should have some kind of a baseline words right and so uh, this is what it is uh, the symbols related symbol and the relationship gives the word and John Searle's idea of the Chinese room. So, then how do we solve this problem? The cognitive approach is not working. So, how do we solve this problem? The solution comes to the solution to symbol grounding problem is in terms of uh, the fact of semantic prime. So, another uh, uh, solution which has been provided to the symbol grounding problem is in terms of semantic primes. And what is this? Is this the, the semantic primes are a set of innately meaningful concepts that are used to define all other concepts. Now, Godard this was defined by uh, someone called uh, Godard in 2002 and so what he says is that the symbol grounding problem can be only explained as in terms of some basic concept which already agree uh, which exist which can define which can be used to define other um, uh, the words and these are called semantic primes. So, what are semantic primes? These are innately meaningful concepts used to define all other concepts and no consensus about how many semantic primes are there or which concepts are used. So, what are semantic primes? Semantic primes are the building blocks. Right? Now, these are what semantic primes and so there are certain building blocks or certain primes which are used, certain kind of words which are used to define all other words and that is how the definition is all about or that is how uh, there is one solution. So, you have certain building blocks or certain concepts which are there to start with and based on that concepts you come up with other concepts and how that is how words attain their meaning. But the problem is that there is no consensus about how many semantic primes are there and which concepts are basic concepts and which concepts are not basic concepts. The other way to look at it is in terms of embodied representation which says that embodied representation it is a symbol that is understood in terms of perceptual and motor experiences it evokes. So, symbols are experienced or the meaning of a word is experienced in terms of the perceptual and <coughs> motor experiences that it is going to uh, evoke and this is uh, by Glenn Berg in 2003 and so what they say is symbols uh, are understood in terms of the perceptual and motor experiences that are uh, uh, go going to uh, that it is going to uh, evoke. For example, if I say angry or any other word for that matter, the kind of perceptual experience if I say apple, the kind of perceptual experiences and motor experiences that it evoke is how you are going to understand that particular symbol and it is it has support from neuroimaging studies. So, certain neuroimaging imaging studies actually also uh, support this particular theory. Now, for example, if and, and, and the example that has been uh, given to this is in terms of look at apple. Now, if I look at apple there is a perceptual experience to related to it and what is the perceptual experience? The shape, the texture, the smell and the taste. So, these are the perceptual experience with apple and that ex these um, embodied uh, uh, cognition actually help us in defining uh, the uh, symbol of eating or the meaning from eating or the word e uh, the, sorry the, the meaning of apple the word apple. Similarly, if we have the word eat it defines the motor movement. How do we eat and so this motor movement defines the symbol or meaning of the word e a t or any other word it, it could be any other word, but then the meaning of this particular uh, word in English and any other language in any other language how this is defined in terms of the uh, uh, motor movement that you do in eating and for apple the meaning is described in terms of the perceptual experiences in terms of shape, texture, smell and so on and so forth. Now, embodied cognition and metaphor. So, basically concrete concepts 
and uh, are and understood in terms of sensory motor experiences. Abstract concepts are understood in terms of metaphors based on sensory motor experiences. So, concrete concepts are understood in terms of sensory motor experiences and abstract concepts. For example, if we look at uh, the concrete uh, uh, example of apple, now this is expressed in terms of sensory motor experiences, but if we look at uh, abstract concepts, these are un un uh, uh, understood in terms of metaphor. So, both uh, concrete eating and uh, apple are concrete, but let us look at the temperature. Now, temperature is basically an abstract concept and how is this concept experienced? So, if we have sensory motor experience, if we have perceptual or uh, motor movement expressing a particular concept, then these are concrete, uh, concrete in nature, these concepts are concrete in nature, but we also have some abstract concept and so how are we are able to understand these abstract concept? For example, the concept of temperature, how do we understand that or how do we um, uh, uh, generate meaning out of it and that we do in terms of the metaphors uh, and the, what metaphors do we use in terms of temperature. So, temperature we use uh, for example, for the temperature rising if you are using the word rise is in terms of motion which is up and motion suggests change and up suggests hot. So, when I say temperature rising how do we um, understand temperature or what is temperature in terms of rising now rise is a motion which is there and say it is an upward motion and the motion then when, whenever we say motion it suggests change. So, rising is basically changing. So, temperature is changing and where it is changing in the upward direction and this up generally suggests hot the way up is there. So, basically these are the metaphors which have been uh, used. So, up metaphor is used for uh, hot the change metaphor is been uh, the motion is being used for change and the up is again in one way it is used for motion in the other way it is uh, and uh, the same metaphor is being used for a uh, uh, different kind of a uh, variety. So, up hot is been represent up is used to represent hot or hot is represented through up change is represented through motion and then motion is represented to up and that is how we we define. So, we use certain metaphors, metaphors are certain uh, uh, sequences that we use a certain kind of words that we use which are uh, which actually define a particular abstract concept. So, basically then what we did in today's lecture let us uh, take a rewind of what we did in today's lecture. We looked at what are words to start with and not only that we looked at what are words, uh, we also looked at what is the form of a word, what kind of classes of words are existing, we looked at the, uh, the content words and then we also looked at the functional words. Now, once we are done with that, we looked at the two basic forms of word which is the phonological form and the context form. So, we, we, uh, we did that quick, uh, we did that uh, uh, looking into or then we looked at several forms of word which are called shape shifters. We looked at what are the shape shifters and how these shape shifters actually work. Then we focused on since, uh, since I said that most words has two form the it has the phonological form of how it is pronounced and it has the meaning form. So, we started looking at the phonological form or the varieties of phonological form of uh, how the uh, phonology of a word uh, exists and we looked at uh, the uh, word in terms of the rhyme and the onset. Right, so <coughs> the onset being uh, the rhyme being further divided as nucleus and the coda, and then we looked at certain phonotactic rules which are used by which are in innate rules, but they are used by people to understand a certain kind of a word. Further to it, we looked at the second form of a word or the second uh, part of a, in which a word is expressed that is the symbol. So, we looked at how words are expressed as symbols and then we looked the and since this is the uh, main problem of, of how the words are related to symbol, we looked at the symbol grounding problem and several solutions to the symbol grounding problem and how these symbol grounding problem actually work in terms of words. Now, when we uh, meet next. <coughs> in the next lecture, we will continue from here and we will look at sound symbolism which is uh, how words are learned and how this word learning progresses and uh, what are the issues to be dealt there. So, till we meet again in the next lecture, it is thank you and goodbye from here.